morning, everybody. Um, welcome today to what we hope is, well, I know it's going to be a very inspiring presentation from our international expert um, historian, uh, Professor Jeremy Suri. Um, my name is Daniel Scannon. I'm the director of the Adelaide MBA, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to introduce you to you. I'd like to formally welcome you on behalf of the University of Adelaide, the MBA program, and our ex executive education unit, all of which offer invaluable development experiences for executives and professionals. But firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is, is the land of the traditional, traditional Kaurna people. And the Kaurna people are one of Australia's many Aboriginal tribes, and we as Australians recognise, value, and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationships to the land. We're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Jeremy Suri here with us in Adelaide, and his son, Zachary. Zachary won't be speaking today, but you might be asking his dad some questions yes. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Jeremy's from the University of uh, Texas in Austin and is currently visiting Australia to contribute to one of the executive education unit's um, leadership programs. It's called the Transformational Leadership Program. It's a unique development that has been designed for leaders from state government here in South Australia and also in Texas. In total, 24 participants from both countries spend time in Australia and Texas. That will be Texas now on the phone, no. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Challenging their ideas and assumptions and developing as leaders. So over the course of eight months, um, this program um, will develop this group and they'll be exposed to leaders across various ideas, disciplines, values and nations. But this is just one of the many unique opportunities for development offered by the University of Adelaide. I hope you're familiar with the uh, Master of Business Administration. The university offers a range of qualifications suited for your needs delivered through very engaging exper experiences and certainly my area of interest, the MBA, is, is a very personal, enriching, transformational um, experience. And luckily, last night, or luckily, I don't know whether the word's luck, but we celebrated our 50th birthday for one of the oldest MBAs in Australia, which is rather exciting. Uh, speaking of engaging experience, a couple of lucky people in the audience will have, uh, if, their, if their business card's drawn out, if you could just put it in the box, um, you'll be welcome to have a cup of coffee with, uh, with Jeremy and I afterwards. Uh, so hopefully, um, best of luck, and I hope someone is prepared to come and have a <laughs> <with Jeremy. laughs> So now to introduce our guest. Jeremy holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair of Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin. He's a professor in the university's Department of History in the Linda B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. He's the author of five books on contemporary politics and foreign policy. And in September 2011, he published a new book on the past and future of nation building titled Liberty's Surest Guardian, American Nation Building from the Founders to Obama. So it's obviously quite contemporary. Professor Suri's research and teaching have received numerous prizes. And in fact, in 2007, the Smithsonian Magazine named him one of America's top young innovators in the arts and sciences. His writings appear widely in blogs and print media. He's also a frequent public lecturer and guest on radio and television programs. Jeremy, welcome to Adelaide, welcome to the university, and welcome to this uh, presentation. And thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. It's, uh, it's really my great pleasure to be here. This is uh, the first time I've been in Australia, actually. We spent a few days in Sydney, and that was just the warm-up for Adelaide. We knew we were that we need to get to the real place eventually, and that's why we're here. Um, I have to thank uh, so many people who have made our visit here just so wonderful. The hosp hospitality, the openness, the warmth. Uh, it reminds me of something I know as a historian and now have come to feel, which is that uh, the American-Australian relationship is really a crucial relationship uh, for our two societies, and it's really wonderful to be a part of that. I want to thank Damien for uh, introducing me and inviting me. I also want to thank, in particular, uh, Joanna Close and Lisa Hunt, who I know have organized this event, uh, and in addition, organized a tour for my son yesterday. He had a lot of fun while I was working yesterday. <laughs> so thank you for that. And uh, now let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, I'll talk for about 30, 35 minutes, and then I hope we have uh, plenty of time for question and answer and discussion. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to hear from all of you. I am a historian, as Damien said, and I'm a historian who studies human behavior and public policy in particular. And I think what's most important for us all to recognize as business people, as politicians, as scholars, is that history is the only laboratory we have for the human experience. It's the only way 
really to study human beings. There are other systematic ways of thinking. There are other models. But human beings defy all categorization. Human beings fundamentally act in ways that are unpredictable. And what we study as historians is the unpredictability of human behavior. And what one seeks to do in life is to manage unpredictability. That is the essence of policymaking. Any foreign policymaker I've talked to from the United States or Europe, I haven't had a chance to talk to many in Australia, but I'm sure it would be true if I talked to them in Australia, they would say that every day it is the unpredictability that structures their life, not the predictability. And the ability to manage that unpredictability is what differentiates successful leaders from others. That's why history is so important. We study the past to think about the future. It is only by looking back that we can think forward. It is only by looking back that we can think forward. We do not study the past because the past repeats itself. We study the past because the past gives us leverage on understanding how human beings are likely to behave in the future, acknowledging that we don't know for certain what will happen. It is by looking back that we can imagine forward. Because when you study the past as a historian, not as an encyclopedist, not as an antiquarian, but as a historian, it's when you study the past as a historian that you understand the paths not taken, the roads and decisions not chosen, and the ways those choices and non-choices help to bring our present world into existence, and the ways in the future new choices will take our world into new places. It is the choices of the past that matter, and it is the choices of the future that will inevitably build upon the choices of the past. Social scientists call this path dependence. They call this path dependence. I would say it is path openness. It is path openness. By studying the past, we see the possibilities for the present. The worst thing about our present world, now I'll be a little critical, is that we don't see the opportunities in front of us. We live in a time of creeping determinism, creeping determinism, when we assume the world has to exist the way it does because it seems so difficult to change it, because we seem so set in our ways. We have more information than ever before. We know more than ever before, but we seem less willing to acknowledge the opportunities before us than ever before. It is by studying history that we can see the opportunities that exist and better understand and hopefully better take courage for the opportunities in front of us. So my argument today is a very simple one. It's an argument about the United States. I think it applies to Australia as well, but you'll have to tell me. I'm not going to claim to know uh, much in detail about your society. I wish I did, and I hope to learn more. But I think I know a fair amount about American history, and I think this will resonate with you today. My argument is that the United States emerged in the last century as a prosperous and dynamic society because of the particular choices made by citizens and leaders during that period. And that those choices were choices that allowed Americans to imagine a new future. And that those choices should inspire us to do what we are not doing in the United States today, which is to think creatively about our future going forward. And as the government shutdown in the United States should make evident to everyone, we are caught in an argument about the past, not an argument about the future. Right? The argument between Democrats and Republicans today is whether we should spend more or spend less, not what we should spend money on, not how we should invest in our future, not what our future vision should be. I will argue that's exactly the opposite of what Americans did in the prior century. It's exactly the opposite of what made America a great country, I believe. And if this continues, we will no longer be a great country. The history should inform us about how we should start thinking differently from the ways we are thinking today. And we can. We will. I'm optimistic we will. Uh, even if no one listens to me, I'm optimistic we still will. Uh, but we must take that inspiration. The challenges that our forefathers faced were much greater than the challenges of today. They faced much greater odds. I tell my students this, and they don't believe me. But it's absolutely true. Think about what it was like to grow up in our society in the United States or your society in the 1930s and 40s and early 1950s. Uh, my grandparents uh, were immigrants from Russia to the United States, and uh, they remembered very vividly what it was like to grow up in the Great Depression. 
And these were vivid but not happy memories. These were vivid but not happy memories. The unemployment rate in parts of the United States was about one in five, 20 percent, 20 percent. I've seen statistics from Australia that put it at higher than that, in fact, in your country. And the United States and Australia faced international foes that were not the Taliban, as difficult as the Taliban might be to fight, uh, but Japan and Germany, hardened military adversaries. And the United States, and I think Australia as well, were not prepared. The United States had barely a standing army, a mediocre navy. We had been in depression and underfunding our military services. Many Americans did not believe the future was bright for them. But yet that generation of Americans, that generation of citizens, they made choices to change their society, transformative choices that made the United States of the 1950s look like a different world from the United States of the 1930s. My grandparents would tell me that actually the changes they saw around World War II were greater than the changes of the Internet, greater than the changes of the technology of the late 20th century, because Americans redefined themselves. They redefined who they were. They turned challenges into opportunities. And they had the ambition and the willingness to do that. How did they do that? How can we take inspiration for that today? This is not to pretend this was a great generation. All generations have their greatness and their weakness. This is not to say they were perfect. But it is to say, as I said when I opened, that there are elements of how they acted that we can take inspiration for today when we deal with the very different world we have before us today. There were human qualities they adopted that can be qualities to serve us today when we face a different set of challenges, but challenges that we must nonetheless face. And so I want to talk about the three things they did. The three things I think as a historian you have to recognize when you read the old letters and the musty books from this period. And the three things that seem so absent in our world today. They are, and I'll take them each in order, the willingness to dream, the emphasis upon dreaming. I would say the generation of World War II was a generation of dreamers, and I'll give you some very concrete examples of that. Second, connecting. They were, and many of you who are social scientists have seen this data just as I have, they were a generation in the United States, at least, and I'm sure in your society as well, who connected on a scale in which others before them didn't. And they connected without internet, in many cases without telephone. They connected insofar as they joined groups. They joined with one another. They were, in the words of Robert Putnam, a generation of joiners, a generation of joiners, not isolators, which is a very big difference from the United States of a generation earlier. The American dream is often the dream to go to the frontier and live on your own with no one bothering you. Right? This generation is actually a generation of joiners. And then most important, I would argue, and perhaps most missing from our world today, this was a generation that emphasized self-improvement over self-indulgence. Doesn't mean they weren't selfish, they were. But they emphasized self-improvement. They invested in institutions of self-improvement. Let me talk a little bit about these as historical phenomena and think about how they are missing in our world today and think about how studying these elements, as I force my students to study them, can hopefully help them think about how they could do the same today in their own way. Dreaming. Dreaming. What made this generation dreamers? They lived, in many ways, provincial lives. The average American coming of age in the 1930s grew up in the country, not in the city. They did not grow up in small towns, even. They grew up in country areas. And the average American at this time grew up without electricity. Without electricity. Lyndon Johnson, famously, President Lyndon Johnson, reflected on how, what it was like to grow up in rural Texas without electricity and said his greatest ambition in life was to turn the lights on to turn the lights on, right? What was it? Well, this generation had radio. This generation began to understand there was a wider world. And they dreamed of how that world could be so different. They dreamed of how that world could change them and others. And they had leaders who encouraged that. Franklin Roosevelt's argument in the Depression was not that Americans would technically figure out how to manage the economy, but that they would work their way out of it by continuing to invent themselves anew. That's what he meant when he said we have nothing to fear but fear itself. He meant 
that it is the fear of dreaming that holds us back. Franklin Roosevelt did not know how to solve the Depression, but Franklin Roosevelt knew how to try new things, to dream of different worlds. He was a man who was crippled, who could not walk, who imagined himself and through the radio made himself into an image of a large, strong father figure. And most Americans of this time will recount how Roosevelt came on the radio to them as a father figure, a comforting figure. He encouraged them to dream. And I encourage all of you to listen to Roosevelt's fireside chats. I was going to play some today, but we don't, we don't have enough time. If you Google, not now while I'm talking, but sometime in the future, if you Google FDR and fireside chat, you can listen to FDR on the radio. And I'm sure you have an equivalent in Australia. And listen to what he says. There are three elements of Roosevelt's encouragement for citizens to dream. Three things so lacking in our world today. First thing Roosevelt says in every one of his radio addresses is that the problems are big and there are no easy solutions. There are no sound bites. There are no simple fixes. There are big problems that take large efforts and that we are in this in the long run. We must dream, he says, because there are no simple solutions. They are not available. We cannot pull them off the shelf. Second thing Franklin Roosevelt talks about is a larger world community. How Americans are not alone, cannot solve their problems alone, but must think of themselves as part of a wider fabric. This was a radical idea at the time. We all claim to think globally today. That was a radical idea at the time. And finally, every one of Roosevelt's addresses is how each citizen can contribute. Roosevelt uses that word that no one uses in American politics today, sacrifice. You are part of the solution if you sacrifice toward the solution. And Roosevelt put this into action. One of the most amazing documents of the 20th century is a document that Roosevelt really forces British Prime Minister Winston Churchill to sign in August of 1941. It is the Atlantic Charter. Many of you have heard of the Atlantic Charter, I'm sure. This is a meeting that occurs between Roosevelt and Churchill off uh, the coast of Newfoundland on a ship, the HMS Prince of Wales. And Churchill has come to the United States, which is not at war yet. He has come to the United States to ask for aid. Roosevelt says, in response for this aid, Winston, we must dream of a different world. We will not provide you aid to preserve the world as it is. We will provide you aid to make the world anew. What does the Atlantic Charter do? It dreams of a world without empires while still living in a world of empires. It dreams of a world of free trade where there had been no free trade. The story of the 1930s is of protectionism, not of free trade. And the Atlantic Charter is one of the first documents to use the phrase human rights. It is not Wilsonian insofar as it's not empty rhetoric. It is actually a commitment. It is a promissory note. And it is sold to the American people that way. It is the early seed for the United Nations. In fact, the phrase United Nations is used in the Atlantic Charter. It is the early seed for the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, which later becomes the World Trade Organization. It is the seed for the World Bank. It is the seed for the Helsinki Accords. It's not that this document made all those things happen. It's that this document began to articulate a dream of a different kind of world. And we know from the historical record that it was that that structured the ways at least Americans thought of World War II. They were not just fighting to defeat fascism. They were fighting to build a new world that they had some sense they could build, some dream that they could make happen. They were not seeking to preserve what they had. They were seeking to create something new. Now, they did all this by connecting in ways they had never connected before. Our society, like yours, has traditionally been an isolated society, a society with lots of land, a society with lots of resources. Frontier societies tend to look inward than outward. This is a common historical insight, right? There is a reason why the Germans always need to look outward, because they have people on all sides of them. There's a reason why Americans and Australians tend to look inward, because we have land and water on all sides of us without lots of people in those places. But World War II changes that in American society. You can mark that shift in American society. And it is that generation of Americans that become connectors in a new way. 
And it is actually the experience of the Depression and the ways in which that generation thought about economic difficulty, so different from us today, thought about economic difficulty and remade their world. And to make this point, I actually want to tell a little story about a man you've uh, all heard of named Ronald Reagan, who is often misdiagnosed uh, or misanalyzed in the ways people talk about him. Uh, Ronald Reagan's hero was Franklin Roosevelt, not a Republican. Ronald Reagan was a Democrat, actually, until the 1960s. And there was a very simple reason why. And if you read Reagan's memoir, you'll recognize this. It captures that moment. It captures what happened in the mid-20th century. Reagan reflects in his memoir, the New Deal saved my family. The New Deal, he said, saved my family. How is that possible? Well, Reagan's father, Jack Reagan, was an Irish immigrant to the United States. And like uh, many Irish immigrants to the United States, uh, he liked the bottle. Uh, but he was also a great talker, like his son, and did relatively well for himself in the 1920s as a shoe salesman in Dixon, Illinois. This is the heartland of American agricultural production in the Midwest. And he basically went from home to home selling people shoes. He was the shoe salesman for the area. When the New Deal, or when the Great Depression hit, Reagan's father had trouble selling shoes and soon did not have a job, which led to him drinking more heavily, which led to problems at home. Reagan recounts, you can read this all in his memoir, he recounts how the most difficult day in his life was as a teenager opening the door one morning and seeing his father planted face down in front of the door. He never actually made it back in to the house after going outside and drinking. What changed things for Reagan's family? Well, the New Deal, a set of new government programs created in the wake of the Depression, provided his father and his family with a new anchor for life. Reagan's father, because he was a good talker and because he knew everyone since he had been a shoe salesman, was brought on by the Federal Relief Administration to be a community organizer. Yes, Reagan's father had the same job as Barack Obama before Barack Obama was president. In fact, in the same part of the country. Obama did it in Chicago, Reagan did it in rural areas. It's, it's funny how this gets lost in the way we polarize our discussions, isn't it? Reagan's father was a community organizer. Reagan's father brought people together, and he was part of a whole generation of people who found a new calling in life, not as people who built their own molehills, but now built communities within which they could find their own place for themselves. This is the golden age in the United States of rotary clubs, of lions clubs, of people coming together to meet in ways they hadn't before. It's marked in every data set I have seen. People started to belong to more clubs. They started to get engaged in more community activities. They started to think of themselves in those ways, in ways they had not before and have not since the 1990s. The golden age for American community connection is the 1930s to the 1990s, and it falls off after that. I know this because I'm sure many of you do the same. I go to a lot of these clubs to talk around the United States, and the average age is in the 60s and 70s and 80s, right? It's people of that generation. It's not the younger people who are part of these groups. These groups emphasized community, and they created a metaphor of common work to deal with common problems before Americans went to war. So here's how you have to understand Americans at war. It wasn't that World War II brought Americans together. It's that the New Deal response to the Depression brought Americans together, which made Americans more capable of fighting that war. It wasn't the war that made us better. There's this strange notion that war makes people better. War doesn't make anyone better. What made Americans better was the coming together before the war. And ask yourself why we haven't done as well in other wars, and look at how we operated as a society before we went into those wars. Right? It's what you do before the war that matters as much as what you do in the war. Americans coming together created whole new ways of thinking about themselves. Let me give you just a couple. The Manhattan Project to produce the atomic bomb was the single largest community science effort ever to that time in the United States, the first federally financed project to produce a scientific discovery in the way that it did, or a scientific outcome in the way it did. The early civil rights legislation in the United States came out of this period. It was Franklin Roosevelt and others who began to sit down with African Americans, who they still did not treat as equal, 
but begin to talk to them about legal change. It is in this context that you get the desegregation of the American Armed Forces and the beginnings of new labor laws to protect African American workers in factories in Chicago and elsewhere. And it is at this time that you see a growth, a growth in American tax paying on a scale that did not exist before. Do not mistake the data. It is absolutely clear. Americans of the 1950s, those who came back from the war, paid higher taxes than any generation of Americans before them. They suffered through the Depression, they fought in the war, and they came back and paid higher taxes, and they experienced the greatest economic growth. I'm not arguing for taxation, but there is no correlation in American history between low taxes and high growth. There is, in fact, more of a correlation in the opposite direction. The late 19th century growth in the United States occurred during a period of high tariff taxation, right? The United States in the late 19th century has a budget surplus because of the high tariff, not personal income tax, but high trade tariff. And in the 1950s, it's high personal taxes that correlate with high economic growth. Again, I'm not arguing to pay more taxes. I don't like to pay taxes either, right? But I am saying that it is historically incorrect to say that low taxes correlate with economic growth. That is not true in American history. This generation that I'm talking about, they felt as part of the community that tax paying was part of their connection. They felt that paying into the community was paying out for themselves as well. Very different from the way we talk about these issues, at least in the United States today. Let me move to the final historical observation that I want to make, which is that this, this generation they improved themselves, and they set a standard of improvement that Americans have basically lived off ever since. What do I mean by that? What do I mean? Well, they were anti-communist, perhaps extreme in their anti-communism, not because they knew much about communism, but they believed that communism was about equality and mediocrity, not about improvement and ambition. Fundamentally, that's what it was about for them. And improvement came through investing and encouraging and creating a culture of excellence. A culture of excellence. And this was put into legislation at the time. The most important piece of legislation for education in the history of the United States is the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, also known as the GI Bill. Think about it. Americans went off to war, they came home, and then they invested in getting educated. They invested in getting educated. Thanks to the GI Bill, which was an alternative to veterans' handouts. Instead of giving people a guaranteed payment as a veteran's benefit, they instead got access to education and home ownership. As a consequence of this, eight million, eight million World War II veterans who came from backgrounds where they were unlikely to go to college, went to college. Eight million. Their names included people like Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, and others. That's how they went to college. 49% in 1947 of newly admitted students were of that background. About half the American population, college population, which had doubled, came from that background. In that same period, two million, two million veterans bought small homes, those who came from families that had never owned a home before. Home ownership became possible in this context. They invested in improving themselves through buying homes with minimal debt and by getting educated. And you want to know why American universities are world leaders today. It's because of this. They are not world leaders before World War II. The great universities before World War II are in Europe. The great people who want to study to become scholars, they don't go to the United States. It is the post-World War II period that you see the burgeoning of American higher education because of the investments of that generation in it. And that's still true. I spend a lot of time with donors, as I'm sure Damien does, and the donors who give to the university are of exactly that group. They're of exactly that group. It's very hard to get young, rich people to give to the university. It's very hard. It's a different ethic that they have. That generation produced the new students, produced the new science, produced the new humanities, produced the new faculties. That's where universities grew. That's where new people came to universities. The great discoverers and business people in America of the late 20th century 
came through because of these changes. Steve Jobs reflected on this himself at the end of his life, and he's one of many. Bill Gates and others. Their access to higher education and the institutions they interacted with were built during this period. What strikes me as a historian looking back is that how that generation emphasized as a culture improvement above all else. You were a great American because you were constantly improving yourself, not because you had more stuff. You were a great American because you were improving yourself, not because you had more stuff. Now, this is a lecture I'm always um, concerned about giving because it can sound like I have nostalgia for another generation. Um, it can sound like I'm trying to make them into men of marble. And that's really not my point. Uh, this generation that I'm talking about had a lot of limits. They were racist. They were sexist. Uh, they were not very open to people of my background, to Jews and other immigrants. They had many, many limitations. Do not get me wrong. I don't believe that there is such a thing as a greatest generation or a worst generation. But I do believe that the times made them different. You see, we are all conditioned by our historical times. The times we live in encourage and discourage certain kinds of behavior. And what the historian can offer is not the ability to transcend your times, no one really transcends their times, but the ability to recognize the times you live in and, in the words of Bismarck, to find a way to nudge history in a new direction. What are the openings for us? What are the places where we can turn the times to our advantage? I revere men like Franklin Roosevelt because they did just that. Franklin Roosevelt did not transform the times he lived in, but he found a way to encourage people to make themselves better. I revere men like Ronald Reagan's father, who found a way to grab on after tragedy to a new life and change the lives of those around them. I revere men like Dwight Eisenhower, who turned the difficulties of a moment into a new articulation of American power and in the American presidency when he was president. We need that kind of action today. We lack it because we are so historically ignorant. What is frustrating to me is not just the absence of great leadership, but the absence of a culture of greatness among our young people. My students in honors classes who have a harder time getting into university than ever before, these are the best of the best in many respects, they don't think they can change the world. They are a generation that's looking for success in the world as it is. And I say that's historical bunk. I say that success historically is about seizing the world and changing it. And that others have done that before. We live, ladies and gentlemen, today in a time of spectacle and drama with few dreams. Our young people don't dream of a different world. We live in a time of email and social media overload. All of us have too many emails that have accrued just in the time we've been sitting here. And we'll all go back to our offices and struggle to catch up with them, right? Uh, but we're not connecting. We're emailing people, but not connecting to them. And we live in a time of incessant credentialing. Everyone in this room has more titles after their name than their forebears would coming in here. But that doesn't mean we're really improving ourselves. We're just getting more titles, right? We're just adding the titles on. We need to look back to recognize that it doesn't have to be this way. The past doesn't tell us what to do in the present, but it can inspire us to think differently. It was the fact that Americans dreamed and connected and improved themselves in a prior generation that made America great. We should not do it the same way today, but we should take inspiration to do it our own way today and not simply accept things as they are. You see, the study of history is the study of how we all can make a difference and how certain modes of behavior are more likely to produce that than others. I'll come back to where I started. The world is unpredictable. I don't have um, a formula for what we should do going next. But I do believe there are qualities of thought and qualities of behavior that are timelessly valuable in unpredictable moments. And that's our job. Our job as a university, our job as business leaders, our job as politicians is to model that behavior. So I will close with this question. Why do we elect and put people into office who don't model this behavior? And when are we going to change that? That will be the moment of historical transformation in our society. And as I tell audiences around the United States that I meet with, when I'm lecturing to an audience like this, don't simply lament what you have around you. Change it. You have the opportunity. You all vote. 
You all have money. You all do things that have and make a difference. Do not accept the world as it is. Use history to help you change the world around you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. That was uh, just an insightful um, I was certainly relevant uh, here. I certainly know from my own perspective that we had an extraordinary growth period in the history of history, but there was a great immigration. We had multicultures coming here with no English, no education, but an incredible work ethic and incredible desire to create a new life. And that really was a foundation of our wonderful what we. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, we education was free back then too. Not that everyone had access to it, but it was free. Right. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll just pose a, a little point here before we open up to the, um, to the audience. But it um, seems to me, uh, and this might strike you as rather odd, but the romantic poet Shelley, uh, I think some people might have heard of Shelley, uh, <laughs> his wife was Mary Frankenstein. Uh, but, uh, and I'm paraphrasing him here, but he said that uh, vision is really about having the ability to see the, the present in the, in the past and the future in the present. And it seems to me that um, if you don't understand the continuum that we're in, and you can't see any glimpse into the future by understanding where you are now and going back, I can't vote for anybody because I haven't got that vision. Right, right. And I think that's part of the problem is that, uh, yes, we are lamenting, and maybe it's us, but um, I think it's a really, it's a difficult, and we talked about it before we, we, we came down here, is there seems to be a, a malaise. Yes. We're all waiting, but nothing's yes. happening. Right. No, I, I think that's right. Hello? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. I think malaise is the right way of putting it, and, and I also think um, part of, Part of looking forward, part of understanding uh, the future and having a vision comes from looking back. That's one of the points I was, I was trying to make. Um, because you don't invent it out of whole cloth, right? It's actually understanding how societies have evolved. And your point about immigration is absolutely true. Uh, I, I'm a reflection of that. My father, uh, Zachary's grandfather, is an immigrant from uh, India. And my mother is the child of immigrants from Russia who came to the United States. And for me, working hard in education was always the highest dream of my grandparents, that, that their grandkids could grow up in the United States. And they still don't understand what I do as a professor, by the way, but they at least respect the fact that I'm educated. <laughs> okay, that's still not working. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to pose? And if you could sort of do it very loud, that would be fantastic. Well, by all means, come down to the microphone. Why don't you call? Yeah. This comes off. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just interested in your sort of thoughts on is it difficult for a country or group of countries who are effectively number one to to change and move forward? You know, if you look at say the Romans, the Romans held on to the legions, even though the legion wasn't what they would need to defend themselves, but the Greeks had the fleet and the fleet was all important, so they didn't move on. Certainly, America and then the American model is, is number one. But do you need somebody from who's not number one to come through with these new thoughts, or, or can the person who's number one reinvent itself? I, I, I think that uh, the, the, everyone heard the question. I, I, I think this is a spot on. Uh, one of the, and this is the point that Edward Gibbon himself makes, right, about the Romans, that it's very hard uh, when you are successful and you feel that you are on top of the world to reform yourself. Because first of all, you're overconfident, and that's the story of Ameri many American mistakes of the last few decades. But also, um, things are going your way. So there's no apparent need to change uh, what you're doing. This is a real, real problem. I tell my students, and I'm sure you say this in business school all the time, right, that you can only become a success after you fail. And it's very hard then to remain a success once, once you are successful. It's very hard to take a critical eye to yourself. That's why I think we need the historical perspective to remind ourselves that we're not always going to be on top and that we have to prepare ourselves if we wish to stay on top to deal with a continuum of challenges, that there is no end to history. Henry Kissinger, I've written about, is very eloquent about this. He says Americans are too likely to think that they've developed the right system, and that's it, full stop. The world doesn't work that way. And so to instill in people a sense 
that there is always a continued need to reevaluate yourself, that is doubly important when you're on top of the world. It's still very difficult. But I would argue that the reason why some societies last longer on top of the world than others is because they do at least a little bit of a better job with that. Um, if I could choose, I'd rather be Victorian England than uh, Philippine Spain, right? And the Victorians are able to at least do a little bit of a better job uh, of this. And, and that's what our job is. That, that's why the humanities are so important, that we provide this insight to ourselves. But I think you, you, you spot on hit the biggest challenge. Success breeds failure. Success breeds failure. And that's the world we're, we're in right now. Yeah, I'd like to think that uh, success breeds Hi, here you go. Thank you for that. Brilliant. Um, you spoke uh, earlier about uh, we know more uh, and we have more information available to us, uh, but we're less, less willing to acknowledge opportunities. Um, can you talk a little bit about the paradox of choice? Because we've got so many opportunities available to us now. Do we get frozen by trying to decide which is the right choice, which is the wrong choice, and just don't make the choice? Right, right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I think the paradox of choice is precisely the right way to look at it. And I, I think of the paradox, well, in three ways. There's the old Eric Fromm approach, which is that people get stressed out and anxious from too much choice, right? Fromm's interpretation of fascism uh, as a German emigre was that the problem was Germans had too many choices and they looked for stability, right? I think of Russia today, right? Uh, I spent time in Russia right after the uh, end of the Soviet Union, and it was a place of an, an enormous freedom, but enormous anxiety for everyone, because freedom meant they could fail, they could go bankrupt, they could starve. So one element of choice is it creates anxiety, um, and people manipulate that. Demagogues manipulate that anxiety. That's what's going on now with the arguments about health in the US. It's a lot of demagoguery, I think, that's, that's surrounding that issue. Uh, but I think the two other ways the paradox of choice works are really crucial for thinking about this, too. Uh, young people think that because they have lots of choices, they can do everything. And they don't want to make trade-offs. They don't want to set priorities. And so this is the problem we have in our policies, too. We want to do everything without saying, well, you can't afford everything, even when you're the richest country in the world. Right? And we can't solve every problem, even though we have the strongest military in the world. The difficulty in making tough choices, right? You can look at our budget deficit today, and you can see very clearly that there are tough choices that have not been made on both sides of the aisle, not because people don't recognize the choices, but because they doubt that the choices require prioritization. And that's part of the paradox of being in a world where people are told you can do everything. You can't do everything, right? Third element of the paradox of choices, the anxiety, there's the desire to do everything. Um, I think what also happens in this world of, of many, many choices uh, for people is they often go the easy route. The easy choices look like the choices that make the most sense because they're most risk averse, right? I see this with young people all the time coming out of our universities who have opportunities to do all kinds of things. They go the easy route, which often means if they get a job in management consulting or something else where they'll make a lot of money, and I don't blame them for wanting to make a lot of money, but not actually pursue their dreams. Uh, this is why our best people don't run for office, right? If you go back 40 years, a, a good lad or a lady coming out of college, the idea was you would run for public office. This was a distinguished thing to do. It's not any longer, and it's not just because of the, the mud in politics. That's always been there. It's because running for office is really hard, and going and taking a job at a big corporation isn't. Uh, and that's, that's part of what at least we've fallen into in the U.S., I think. More questions? Oh, now you'll be really fit. <laughs> Very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I think it's true to say that we live in a world that is more obsessed by science and evidence based than it is by history. Yes. Um, do you have any point as to how we can convince decision makers that history is in fact evidence? Yeah. Great question. Um, and uh, I. I'll, I'll start speaking as Damien makes his way. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say that because... Oh, I please, go ahead, go ahead. Part of our problem is that I think quite the opposite, is that we don't have a democratization of science and our conversation turns into beliefs and values yes. rather than uh, some evidence that I'll let you... No, no, I th well, I think both, both points are correct. Certainly in the United States, I think more so than in your country. 
you're better on this than we are, I think, my perception is. Uh, we, we, are in, we talk about science, but it's not really evidence-based science. It's science often based on faith. Uh, and I don't mean faith, and I have no problems with religious faith, but I mean more sort of faith on assumption of what you want to believe. And it just look at the discussions about climate in the United States, and, and, and you see that. So I think that's, that's one element of the problem. But I also think that what this gentleman said is, is correct, too. There is a cachet around science and engineering that there often isn't uh, around uh, the humanities. And part of it is of the perception of certainty, that there are right and wrong answers. We might disagree on what they are, but right and wrong answers in science. And people say, well, history, it's, it, there's no right or wrong answer. It's about interpretation. And of course, that's true. So I actually spend a lot of time in the US trying to work with policymakers on helping them to use history. Uh, it's sort of something I, I deeply believe in. And, and I spend time with the army and with other groups doing this. And uh, I think there are actually many routes to show quite clearly why history is valuable. And we just need to be better at doing that. I'll give you three, three avenues I've tried to pursue on this with, with, I don't know, mixed success and failure, I guess. One is uh, most anyone who's in a position of power wants to feel like the problems they're confronting are problems others have confronted before. No one likes to feel they're doing something for the first time. There's a comfort. There's a social psychologist talk about this. There's a confidence that comes in knowing that others have stepped in your shoes before you. Right? And that's where history helps a lot. Every American president, at least since Carter, has spent a lot of time reading history and talking to historians once in office, but didn't before. Uh, and I think it's part of this, this phenomenon. Right? Others have been here before. So for George W. Bush, he started reading a lot about Harry Truman. Because of course, Truman left office very unpopular. And Bush wanted to feel, well, like Truman, one day people will see me as being a great pioneering president. So there's that element of connection to the past that we all feel. That's why we study our family histories, right? Second element, um, I think there's just the very basic element of in a world where we're operating in different cultures, anyone who spent any time doing that recognizes that people come even to scientific questions with different cultural assumptions. And those cultural assumptions are historically determined. So this is where I work a lot with the US military to help them understand the histories of the regions they're interacting in. It, it is scandalous how little Americans knew about the Middle East before they sent soldiers over there, right? How little we speak Arabic. It's still a problem with China. Whenever I go to China, I, I lecture in English as I do here, and people listen in English and ask questions. But if I bring a Chinese scholar to the US, they have to speak in English. They, they can't do it in Chinese, right? It's probably the same here, right? Who is studying whom better? And that's a historical question, it seems to me. So that's a way of operationalizing it. But then third, I'd say fundamentally, uh, politics, policy, in the end, is, is about values, right? It's about what do, you, what do you value, and where do you get your sense of value? But from studying human society, uh, it seems to me. And, in the United States, we have an easy way to make this case because there's this sort of fetish of the founding fathers. And so you can say, look at what they did. What were their values? Don't we need to study that if we want to understand our values today? Uh, but all these are things we need to work on doing better because there is more cachet in perceptions of science, even if they're not always the accurate uses of science. I think it's remarkable that says Yeah. Any more questions? What we got? I think we're okay. Thanks for your talk. Could you comment on the role of government in um, dreaming, connecting, and improving? It seems to me that the post war reconstruction period that the role of government was a lot more central. Perhaps today we face the relentless or unrelentingly creative government in the primacy of markets, but to the extent perhaps more so in the US than here, we, we somewhat live in a stateless society. And uh, it appears that we all use that. Um, I think that's a great question, and I think it's too often framed in government versus market. Um, Government played a much more significant role in people's lives in the mid-20th century, but it wasn't government bureaucracy. It was government leadership. It was government inspiration. It was, it was the guidance of government. And uh, one of the problems is, I think, at least in the United States, government became, after World War II, and there are a lot of very good studies of this, became more administrative and bureaucratic than, than uh, political in its leadership. 
And so what that means is that many people interact with government in a way that is not about the values they'd want to see in government. It seems professionalized and bureaucratized. Um, and that's why they get a negative view. But if you push that hard enough, at least in the United States, it's not really a negative view of government. It's a negative view of certain kinds of government. Let's just take a classic example, right? Americans, more than people in almost any other society, value the role of national defense. Isn't that government? The most respected institution in the US is the military. It's one of the only ones. Congress has like a 13% approval rating. The military has about an 85% approval rating. The joke was that actually Americans loved the military too much to send soldiers to die in Syria. They wanted to send Congress to die in Syria. Right? Um, but so that's, people will say they're anti-government and they're pro-military. Well, that doesn't mean they're anti-government then, right? I mean, <laughs> they are cert they're in favor of certain elements of government. When they say they're anti-government, they don't like the regulation and the things that they feel are limiting their ability to get things done. And I think this is a real problem because it's not government versus market. What it is is good government. The founding fathers, if you read the Federalist Papers, what they talk about is not the size of government, they talk about the quality of government. Is it good government or not? And what we don't have in the United States today, we, I mean, we have good government relative to a lot of other places, but we don't have anywhere near the good government of the standard that we wanted. Look at the members of Congress. Is that good government? Look at the people who serve in a lot of state legislatures. Um, I look at the people in Texas who serve in the state legislature, and this is not a partisan comment, but um, most of them would have, getting, have trouble getting hired at our major corporations, right? They're just not of that quality. Because the good people go into the corporations, they're not, they're not in government. So I think that the way to solve the problem is to make government do its job better, rather than to say it's about more or, or less. And, and this is, again, part of the insight uh, that Franklin Roosevelt had. Now, the idea of the New Deal was not to create a lot of bureaucracy. It was to get good people involved in doing things that would make their communities better. And I think uh, Americans will support that. I think what they don't like are the faceless bureaucrats who don't seem to want to make um, their, their lives any better. I, I'll just give you a personal example of this that comes up in our family all the time, and Zachary has to listen to this a lot. My wife is very involved in work on parks in our, in our city. She, she's, you know, because we have young children, very committed. And uh, what she finds time and again is the people in city government who oversee the parks hate parks. They don't help. And so my, my wife is a left-leading Democrat, loves the idea of health care and, and, and government, but she's frustrated and now becoming almost anti-government toward the city because of the people in the park service. That's unacceptable, right? That's unacceptable that government operates that way. So it's a good government that's the answer, not small or less government. Thank you. It seems to me that the people we get in governments all over the world are inspired by putting themselves forward as being heroes or they want to make the most money. And many, many people are not in services here because it's the Great Depression every day. And those people are just people without education, the poor people, of which there are millions in Australia. It, it, it seems education and having the opportunity to make changes is for people who already have all the opportunities, but they do nothing. I, this gives me time to think, actually, about what to say. This is good. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yeah, that, I'm glad you did. <laughs> I, I, I agree with a lot of what you say. Um, and uh, this is why most people who study history are not blind-eyed uh, optimists. Uh, it's very easy to become pessimistic. Because what, what you said is actually timelessly true, right? Um, and uh, it, it would be nice if uh, when change occurred, change was evenly spread and opportunities were evenly spread. We'd like history to work that way. 
Um, but it doesn't. Um, I, I'm a firm believer, uh, in spite of my wishes it were different, that change happens because those with opportunity and access to resources make change happen and hopefully help others too. And I think we need to hold ourselves to those standards. We, we can't expect change to come from everywhere. And I think too often, because what you said is factually true, people say, well, my students will say, well, we're privileged, but we can't change this, so we need to do just for ourselves. I say, no, you're in a privileged position to make change happen for others. And people need to be held to those standards by those who have power as well as those who don't have, have power. I, I think that's, that's crucial. And, and that is probably what differentiates one society from another more than anything else. Uh, because the problems we've talked about in our society in the US and in yours are, of course, lesser than they are in many other societies. Um, and that's because we don't tolerate it getting quite so bad. But we certainly shouldn't tolerate it just being as it is as it is now. We need to hold ourselves to higher standards. That's the best way to deal uh, with, with, these, with these issues. And make sure that we are attentive to those. Uh, we ignore what you're saying. Um, think about our cities, at least in the US. I don't know if it's way in Australia. You can have the wealthiest and the poorest living side by side. And the wealthiest never see the poor. Right? We need to remind ourselves that they're there and make ourselves uh, uh, focus focus on that. Um, I'll remind you that you know, Franklin Roosevelt came from one of the most elite families possible, but yet he was able to at least connect with some of those who were poor, some of those who were left out. That, that's what leadership uh, is about, and that can come from the business community. That's what philanthropy is about, when philanthropy is done, done the right way. So it, it does have to be about the elites, I think. I don't think change comes from the bottom. I think change actually comes from the top. Yes. Just very quickly, you uh, spoke about self improvement over self indulgence and then went on to institutional education by uh, coming on to university as well, whatever it is. What about the self improvement uh, Anthony Robbins style movement there? Is there value in that as well? Yes, I mean, I think there are all kinds of self-improvement and, and, and many people uh, of that generation, like my own grandfather, who didn't go to college, improve themselves without having to go through education. Uh, in my cynical moments, I sometimes think in the United States what we do is we bring into the universities those who are already the best and they just, we just sort of march them through, right? And they come out and we say, oh, they're so great, but they came in that way also, right? So um, maybe it's not really about universities. It, it is to me more whether you structure your investments and your time around self-improvement uh, self rather than around self-indulgence. And, and I think we can mark the differences. This comes back to the initial question about Rome. It's a point Edward Gibbon makes about Rome. He, he chronicles how Romans start spending more time on what he calls decadent activities than on the activities that led to self-improvement. And it's, again, a problem of being rich and fat rather than young and striving <laughs> as a society. Right? So I think self-improvement can come in many different ways. Um, but it, it, it's an ethic. It's a way of living. It's a way of, it's a way of thinking. Um, I look in the United States at some people and who are constantly demanding higher salaries. Again, I have no trouble with people making money. I'd like to make a lot of money, too. I have no problem with that, right? But it would have been unseemly in another time, right, to flaunt wealth in that way because there was a different ethic about what it meant to be a good person. You might have had a lot of money, but you wouldn't flaunt it in a certain way because that ran against that ethic. I think there's a value in that, just as one needs passion, one needs an ethic in this. I'm not for equality, I'm for people being able to have ambition, but also an ethic about how you use the resources of that ambition. I must say, a bit of a poke for the NBA, we certainly pride ourselves on the people that come out differently, and the people that come out wanting to make a difference and have the ability and confidence to make a difference. So we don't want to push them forward, we just have to be better than our name, and clearly we don't want to make a difference. I'm sure that's true. So look, um, can we just all thank Jeremy for a very inspiring <laughs> 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 <laughs>